So just thought we could begin with a, a quick summary of my study as a whole and kind of what I've been researching. So I'm looking at the impact of COVID on the events industry and then how that has kind of created this boom in virtual events. Um, so the purpose of this session in particular is to look at the recent government announcements um, kind of the roadmap to out of out of COVID restrictions. So Rob, if you want to take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Des. So, yeah, the government, um, as you may well um, be aware, has announced a, a four step um, roadmap um, uh, basically out of lockdown. And, and part of that is uh, is addressing the return to, to live events. Um, step one isn't really that relevant from a, from a larger event perspective. So we'll go straight to kind of step two. And that says that no earlier than the 22nd of April, um, there will start to become um, event pilots uh, looking at the feasibility of, of starting um, indoor and outdoor events um, as we read it. And then no earlier than the 17th of May, which is step three, um, we're looking at indoor events um, with up to a thousand people or 50% capacity, whichever is, is uh, lower. Um, outdoor events for 4,000 people um, or 50% capacity, whichever is lower and large seated outdoor venues uh, with 10,000 um, people or 25% capacity, whichever is lower. Um, so that's step three. And then moving through to step four, uh, which is going to be no earlier than the 21st of June, um, there is going to be um, basically the return of larger events, um, both festivals, um, indoor and outdoor. Um, so that's the plan. Um, so yeah, let's discuss. Yeah. So a quick overview then how do you guys feel about the the news of those restrictions being lifted hopefully by the 21st of june so i mean it, just from a sort of societal point of view it's obviously brilliant that we're talking about the end of restrictions and that sort of thing never mind event uh, events um but yeah i i, I mean i will be really interested to see how uh, how we as an industry and our clients, the people that we work with, um, are interested to see yeah, how how they take the news. And there's obviously that there's that sort of debate about you know what you what you could do based on what Rob's just mentioned, but then actually what you should do. Um, and you know will uh, will people rush to be booking live events where people might uh, not necessarily be in the in the in the headspace for them? Um, so it'll be. It'll be interesting to see, yeah, I think how 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 clients perceive this news. I think as, as an industry, I think the industry is is ready for it to come back. But I think the industry has been ready for live events to come back since, I don't know, probably near enough a year ago. I think there's, there's a, you know, it has been working tirelessly to make sure that when live events do come back, they come back in a really sort of safe way. So I don't think that will be an issue. Um, but it's more about, I guess, yeah, how our, how our clients perceive the news and uh, how, how, more importantly, how their people will feel about it. So. You know what, Ben? I think you are totally right. I think we're going to see a bit of a variety of how people feel. I think some people are so desperate to get back together that they're going to jump on the live events as soon as they can. And then there are still some people that are saying, no matter what the restrictions are or lift of them, that they have a corporate responsibility to take it a little bit slower um, and do it in their own time. But I think the biggest bit that we've we've seen is just how hard it is when it's so unclear what we've got. So just having some guidance and something to work towards is going to I don't know, help everybody make their plans, whether it is jump back in straight away or look to do it at the end of the year or in 2022. But just just that clarity is just going to make such a difference. Mm, do, do you think there is, do you think that has given us clarity though? So the, the 21st of June is 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 a date. It yeah. really, you know, that is the earliest possible opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, do you think that people have clarity with that day or... Do you th yeah, I think that there's, there's hope, isn't there? I mean, that we talked yeah. about October the 1st last year and then that didn't transpire. Mm -hmm. And they've already said it's about data, not dates, um, as to whether they'll adhere to that plan. But I think just it was so unknown, people had no idea. So at least now they can start to make a plan, whether or not they're ready to commit straight away. We can track it now. You know, we're not the first date. So if everything else starts to happen on time, yeah, true. then it's going to give us more foresight into it, I think. 
I think mm -hmm. once people start to get into May and June, and if those dates have all been implemented and we, we've hit all the um, data we need to do in terms of COVID numbers, people will start to feel like they can have a bit more assurance around booking live events and that they may then start to think, well, we want to give it a couple of months after we're allowed to do them anyway. And it's probably start small from September to December-ish this year. I, I think there'll be a lot of companies that want to do perhaps roadshow styles events or they want to do something a bit more in-house where they're not taking um, delegates out to venues. They're bringing them in-house in their offices and those smaller events will start to happen first to, to get a gist of whether as a company their delegates have the appetite to attend these events and if they're comfortable attending these events mm -hmm. interesting as well because they've said that actually in terms of that key day that 21st of june they're not going to announce that any sooner than seven days out yeah. so it's only going to be seven days before the 21st of june so, so as in you know 14th of june that they're going to make that official so i, I think it's <laughs> very unrealistic to expect there to be all of a sudden this influx of live events from the 21st of june no. i think it'll be a very brave business or ceo or company that that says do you know what on the 22nd of, of june let's do it let's go for it um mm -hmm. so I, I agree with casey i think there's going to be a phased return back and, and i think it'll probably start to ramp up sort of q4 2021 which yeah. is typically when we'd expect it to get busier anyway you know after school holidays and uh, when, when kids are typically back at school anyway mm. yeah that leads right. quite nicely on to um kind of what format do you guys think that events will take from the 21st of june like you're saying are, are they going to rush back are they going to stay kind of virtual I and mean, there's talk of hybrid what are your views on that i think i think it's really interesting i think it would be Again, it would be a brave business that in the early stages of a return of live events to purely run with a live event. Um, I think the situation is very different to when we're looking at the 1st of October for the return of live events because we've now obviously got a vaccination in place. But I, I believe that every live event needs to have a digital element to it now going forward, um, either to fall back on in case um, uh, a live event can't happen for whatever reason because of restrictions, um, or because delegates either aren't going to be able to or aren't going to want to travel because of the, the massive shift now in the way that people are working. Uh, and, and because I don't believe that people will, there'll be an, on, an onslaught of people returning to, to the office nine till five. In fact, a, a survey that one of our clients did with their, with their, um, uh, their employees actually said that 98% of them had no intention of returning back to a normal nine to five. Um, Monday to Friday week. So I think that the change in society and the change in the way people work will mean that there's got to be a digital element involved as well. Um, and that can't be an afterthought. That's got to be the same level of experience as the live event, albeit a different experience. It's just got to be on the par with it. Yeah. yeah. This is my challenge with when we start talking about hybrid events, because I think there are so many elements to get a hybrid event right that it takes an awful lot of sort of, I don't know, planning um and design point of view to just make sure that you can design an agenda that makes the most mm. out of a live audience versus those remotely how do you keep two audiences feel connected as one and um, still make the most of the room when you're in in a live situation but not ask people to spend 10 hours on a on a call because that's how long they're there in real life so I think there's going to be a real learning curve of how to integrate live and digital audiences together mm. I think that that's a really good point, Floss, because I think, yeah, the, the worst thing that you could do would be to run a live event and then have the sort of virtual audience Both as an afterthought, yeah. uh, because yeah. that is, you know, that is the least inclusive thing you could do. And, you know, this, you know, looking at the positives of, of this situation, it has definitely widened event audiences and given the opportunity to be a lot more inclusive. Uh, in terms of the audience who who can attend, so if, yeah, the last thing that we would want it to you know, creating hybrid events is to, is to lose that element. Um, uh, or, or, also, do, or do both really badly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Kind of think right. Okay, well we've got a budget. Let's uh, you know you kind of need two separate budgets for two separate experiences rather than taking your event budget and halving it and doing neither really well because. Yeah. the experience of the delegate you know you're not going to achieve what you set out mm. to achieve and that that is a real danger i think also it would be great thinking about it if you know we've done some really cool innovative 
um, like outdoor events in the past, both conferences and, you know, the sort of more sort of festival party style of things. So, you know, maybe they are some of the, uh, you know, they are some of the events that will come back first. Though, you know, we know that, you know, COVID wise transmission is, come, you know, low outdoors. So maybe they're some of the things where, where companies could look at, um, you know, could look at pushing first, you know, those sort of outdoor events, outdoor conferences and road shows and that sort of thing. That'd be quite, um, that'd be quite good to look at. You're yeah. right. And I think there's a, I'm not sure virtual is ready to go yet because I think they do mm. different things. So like you said, like the outdoor parties and stuff like that, you, you can't replace that the same way virtually. Yeah. But actually we found out there's a way to connect all of your colleagues together and uh, not have to worry about travel restrictions or venue capacities or anything and virtual is a really brilliant way to do that so some of the biz some of the clients that we're chatting about is a mix of both now so can we get people together in a live capacity where it is about I don't know that connection of people and cultural stuff and then can we virtually reach out to everybody and maybe we'll find a place in our comms world to use both as tools going forward we've had a discussion with some clients that they're already considering alternating between a live event one year followed by a virtual event the next because of the level of feedback they've got around not having to travel not having to stay over not having to be away from home versus wanting to do those things they've got a real mix so they actually have now an appetite to do one year of virtual one year of live mm. rob you obviously mentioned that uh someone had gone out and gone out to their people and said you know what are their views on uh, what are their views on going back to the office but it'd be also great to you know go out to people that, you know what are your views about attending live events and let's yeah. you know get the research in early see where people you know see where people are at and see see what people want to do and what they're comfortable doing and then you know our response is then uh, you know according to, to to that data mm. um, i think that's really important asking people how they are and i think it's important to do that research now and then mm. to redo yeah. that research in the summer once restrictions have listed once we've got past 21st of june and everything is running in sense of the normal world we knew it before to then ask people how they feel about it once they live in it because I think the responses could be quite different between now and June. Yeah I show. agree I think I think when when people get into the swing of some kind of normality I think um yeah I, I'm not saying risk will necessarily drop but but that perception of doing that you know once it starts to feel normal again I think will will change people's perceptions massively. Yeah. I think the other thing I was just going to add as well is that doing things virtually has shown us that a, an event doesn't have to be nine till five you know it can it can be four weeks six weeks long and especially with people working remotely and all the distractions that, that remote learning brings you know realistically we've, we've said this for a long time but a nine till five conference agenda isn't isn't really right so i think there's a balance as well between having on demand content and live content so maybe kickstarting with something live or maybe even finishing the event with something live but then having a whole host of, of on-demand content that people can dip in and out of when they want at their will uh, and it feel a bit more self-directed that rather than a bit you know you must be here at this time. Given that then and, and kind of your views of what what you think is going to happen for the 21st of June how do you guys see the events industry kind of past that almost looking at 2022 and and beyond do you think people will snap back straight into live events and kind of forget the virtual aspect or again do you think they do you think they're here to to work alongside them i think I, I think i mentioned before i think there's been some really good innovative stuff that has come out of the past year and you know virtual event world uh it was definitely it was definitely a side of the industry that you know we would never profess to be experts at you know a year ago and the amount that we've learned and tried to sort of yeah I guess innovate within that space and yeah how can we use all of that information and all of those techniques that we've learned and implement in in live event that's quite exciting and there's been some really I think some floss we've been you know looking over the course of the year at some really sort of cutting edge you know partnerships products you know though it would be great to 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 sort of bring into live event world as well I think so I think I you know that I think it's quite exciting being able to uh, to, to well look to look further than the sort of next month two months uh, and you know beyond I think yeah you're 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 right and Darcy this is something we were chatting about the other day 
I think our industry, although it's fast paced, it's it's described as the fifth most stressful job in the world to be a project manager in an events industry, but hmm. it is behind the times in compared to every other industry out there. You know, we were more tech averse is probably the wrong way to talk about it, but it was human connection and relying on old ways that were tried and tested. You know, we still got people up on stage that did an hour and 45 minute, two hour slots, even though mm. concentration levels have changed based on how we just communicate with the rest of society. And I think, like Bain said, this is hugely exciting mm. to make us do events and communications differently. And if we can take all the stuff that we loved back in live event world and take the new technology and the new ways to interact and to learn and to digest information and bring the two together, then it's a real opportunity to shake up this industry and do things a little bit differently. And from my kind of creative psychology perspective, I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to getting hands on that. I, I think I think the other bit that I would still stress is that you know, virtual events, someone asked me at the beginning of this, will virtual events, is this the end of live events? And absolutely not. You know, we are yeah. innately social creatures. And yeah. I think, you know, irrespective of how introvert you are, you know, there's something around being around other people and, and, and whatever else. And that need to get together with people, I think, is is innately human. Um, so I agree. I think, I think it's taking the learnings from live events in the kind of the short, sharp sessions, you know, not just presenting to people and at people and making it innovative and keeping it um keeping it engaging and applying that into a live format you know your, your agenda doesn't need to be eight hours long it could be four hours long it could be yeah. three hours long yeah. but let's take the best bits of what we learned from virtual and, and now actually apply it to live events as opposed to the other way around because i think there's lessons yeah. to be learned from both yeah Definitely. and it's really shone a light i think on like some of the diversity and inclusion stuff you know how the accessibility we've had to make make room for on virtual events and um, how we culturally bring a business to life and I think it's an opportunity for us to really integrate some of that going forward um, mm. when we can get people back together again I mean we so many people have been offering business support because of how hard it's been on like well-being and your mental health being stuck on your own so I think we can use events to really focus on stuff that's important and um yeah I d yeah I don't know just just do things a bit differently really look at the like environmental psychology and the space we put people in the impact that that's going to have and really start to dig deeper on um the execution of events going forward by the way Rob we're no, we're, just to let you know we're, we're not coming back to the office nine till five yeah we're not coming back <laughs> sorry this is done now <laughs> Good, because neither am I. If I'm not bothered, I'm just, I'm quite happy here. I made, I made a little garden shed. I'm just moving into that. I'm not even going to put the lawnmower in. I'm just, I'm literally I'm living sure in Jen will be pleased to know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I need. A little bit of wildlife, a little bit of sunshine. Happy days. When you said before, I've done that study with a client and they're like 90 something, don't want to go back nine till five. And I was thinking, is that us or was that someone yeah. else? That's been great, guys, getting your insight in, uh, in that and kind of your views on what you think the industry will look like. So. Thank you for your time, and I hope everyone's enjoyed watching as well. And thanks, thanks Das, for um, for yeah, putting uh, putting you on the spot and uh, and grilling us. But no, it's been really enjoyable. Thank you. Cheers, Das. Thanks. Cheers.